The lifestyles of modern day people require a lot of energy. To produce that energy, we've done incredible damage to nature and the environment. But it is possible to do things differently. Welcome to a new edition of Echo Africa. I am Chris Alems in Ogun State, Nigeria. Thank you, Chris. It is true that there are loads of encouraging projects underway to help restore and also protect nature. We'll be showing you some of them in the next half hour. I am Sandra Twinovdio here in Kampala, Uganda, and here is a preview of what's in store. Passenger boats in Lagos help residents circumvent traffic jams. Coal pits in Germany are transformed into natural oases. And solar power is changing rural life in northern Ghana. Going to school every single morning is a routine for many children. But for Marco and Caesar, it is fundamental to their survival. They are often chimpanzees in Guinea. Poaching and the destruction of habitats have shrunk cheap populations. Now thousands have been orphaned and some species are even facing extinction. The Chimpanzee Conservation Center in Guinea is trying to help. Marco and Caesar are leading the way into the bush. They are often baby chimps rescued from animal traffickers. Now they live at the Chimpanzee Conservation Center, a sanctuary located in the National Park of Upper Niger in East Central Guinea. The country is home to more than 30,000 wild western chimpanzees, the largest population in the region. However, the numbers of these great apes, with whom we humans share more than 98% by genetic blueprint, have declined dramatically in the last 20 years. They're now critically endangered. The, principal cause of the, the, the main causes of chimpanzee extinction are the destruction of their habitat due to human activities and poaching. People kill them with no regard for the law that protects them. In Guinea, chimpanzees are often poached for their meat or sold as pets. Chimps like Marco, who've been seized by the authorities, are brought to the center. This sanctuary rehabilitates chimps and then releases them into the wild. Around 60 great apes are currently living at the center which is funded by international organizations and private donors. The chimps' day gets off to a swinging start, with a breakfast of fruits and ginger tea to combat the cold. A routine health and psychological checkup follows since they often arrive suffering from health problems and trauma. Then an excursion into the forest helps the young chimpanzees adapt to the wild. The forest is important for the chimpanzees. We walk with them through the forest so they can get used to it as it is their habitat. Here they can find food and a place to sleep. But for Marco and his pals to return to the forest, they need large open spaces to hang out in. Yet human activities like agriculture and logging are destroying the national park. The loss of sufficient healthy habitat means just 20 chimps could be released since 2008. The Chimpanzee Conservation Center contributes to species protection through rehabilitation and reintroduction. But also by educating the local community. Because it's the community that's destroying the environment, so these people need to be educated and sensitized. That's very, very important for a project like this one. The center has launched different projects to raise environmental awareness within the communities living in the park. Among them is a weekly radio show. It informs listeners about the park's flora and fauna, its natural resources, and how to protect them. An educational program at primary schools inside the park also teaches future generations about the importance of conservation and the threats chimpanzees face. Since its start in 2019, 
more than 700 students have taken part in these workshops. We run these programs in schools to teach children while they are young, so they can grow up with the idea and also pass this information on to others to protect the environment. To safeguard the chimps' habitat, conservation and education are crucial, but so is providing alternative sources of income that promote sustainable development locally. Along with villagers and two women's associations, the centre has created lasting employment opportunities and launched a plastic recycling project which supports more than 300 women. We make soap and now we also recycle plastic bags and turn them into laptop sleeves or little purses. We also sew shopping bags for the women so they don't buy plastic bags at the market anymore. It's a win-win solution. These projects provide locals with a steady income, raise environmental awareness and ease the pressure on the ecosystem. And could soon give Marco, Caesar and their fellow chimps enough space to go ape in the wild. Preserving habitats is one thing, but what if they've already been destroyed? We ask, can nature still be brought back? Now, our hunger for materials has devastated landscapes all over the world. In Germany, a number of regions are now having to cope with the gaping holes left by open peat lignite mines. Now, one former industrial hub near Berlin offers some hope that transformation and restoration are indeed possible. The East German village of Großkoschen is bustling with summer visitors. It's just 150 kilometers south of Berlin and not far from the Polish border. The bikes offered at Eckart Hoika's rental are in high demand, with visitors keen to explore the region. The six-seater is finally going for a spin. It's been idle all day. Hoika started his business here 20 years ago. Back then, no one believed that this region of Lusatia, or Lausitz as it's known in German, could attract any tourists at all. The area was solely associated with the Brankel industry. It was a moon landscape like this. The locals thought Eckart Hoika was crazy. People kept asking me, what do you do? Show people the holes? The mood was different back then. There was still a lot of the pits from the open cast mines. Today, locals are proud of what's happened here. The vast open pits are gradually being transformed into Europe's largest lake landscape. Once complete, the Lusatian Lake District will cover 350 square kilometers. It's helping Lausitz transform into a green holiday region with broad cycling lanes, hotels, and landmarks like the Rusty Nail, which serves as a reminder of the region's industrial past. From the top of the tower, visitors can observe another new lake in the making. The former open cast mine is slowly being flooded by groundwater. It's really something special. I mean, how many people can show you a completely new landscape? If everything goes as planned, this will be finished by 2025, God willing. The shore's been developed and stabilized. There's still some work left to do over there. That should take another year or two. In its prime, the coal industry in Lausitz employed 80,000 people. But in the late 1990s, the energy sector in Germany was restructured. Dozens of unprofitable mines were closed. 90% of the workers lost their jobs. One in five people left the region. Only four open cast mines remain active in Lausitz today, but their days are numbered too. Germany has pledged to phase out coal completely by 2038. Transforming this mining landscape cost the German state upwards of 250 million euros last year alone. Between 1992 and 2016, 10.2 billion euros were spent. Lime needs to be added to the lakes to ensure they are not too acidic for wildlife and for swimmers. 
Last year, more than 30,000 tons were required to balance pH levels. Then, there is maintenance and risk assessment work carried out by geoengineers like Philipp Soltau. It's his job to ensure that there are no landslides. After decades of digging, the soil is more loose and can be moved more easily by groundwater if it rises quickly. This huge wave was triggered artificially so that land areas could be moved in a very effective way. There's a landslide happening underneath, moving further and further back, and it's these forces that create the sudden wave. At the bottom here, we see trees are knocked over like matchsticks. There are very powerful forces at work. Officials only wanted these kind of landslides to happen in control circumstances. In 2010, this area saw a natural landslide, which is why entry is now unauthorized. Back then, several trucks were drowned in the tsunami-like wave. Their drivers only just rescued in time. This work will take generations. We still have to make 30,000 hectares of land safe as part of the basic reconstruction work. We need to develop certain technologies, like non-invasive blast-induced compaction to strengthen the soil. The transformation from what the landscape once was to what it is now is radical. And there's no blueprint on how to do this work. Another vision that has come true is the transformation of Lausitz into a tourist destination that combines green spaces for leisure and an industrial past that visitors want to learn about. Be it on this old conveyor bridge, now surrounded by parks of renewable energies, or on a guided tour with people who were born here, like Eckhart Hoika. He observed the rise and fall of the brown coal industry for himself, and he's still shocked by the devastating impact that the last few mines left in Lausitz are still having on the land. I see it myself. The landscape is being destroyed. I hope that someone will develop better storage capacities for renewables to increase their use. This over-exploitation is not the future. Between 40 and 45 percent of Germany's energy comes from renewables. Fossil fuels like brown coal still play an important role, but the country is now paving the way for life after the coal. Germany has created a blueprint that could be of use for other countries that still have that path ahead. Wow, very interesting. Vacationing in a former coal pit. How cool is that? And if it helps with the transition from the fossil fuels, then I'm all for it. I agree, Sandra. And moving away from fossil fuel doesn't just protect the environment. In some cases, it also saves money especially when it comes to indoor heating in Europe during the winter months. Just a few hundred kilometers from Germany's border in Poland, an old row house was converted with astonishing results. One prefab apartment block among many in Poland stands out. The cars stop here, and the people take photos. It is pretty unusual. I'd also recommend trying this to everybody I know. The building's residents are quite relaxed about the coming winter. I enjoy looking at the generator. It makes electricity and money. Shitno is a small town in southern Missouri. It has one attraction, a 1970s prefab at number 12 Schlonska Street. The balconies sporting solar panels were added on in September. Head of the Residents Association, Zbigniew Krakowski, makes his routine rounds. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, Ella. I just wanted to see if her installation is working properly. Everything's all right on my end. No scratches. It was built in correctly, but right now I'm cold. All right, Ella, go back inside. 
The facade may be an acquired taste, but in the end, that's secondary. The former coal cellar has been converted into an office for the two visionaries, as the residents call their building managers. The idea for the innovative energy system came from a simple lack of cash. It was a tragedy. The power company put us under financial pressure. Believe me, I did ask them to let us pay in installments. They just laughed at me. Oh, you don't have any money. That gave me the impetus. That was back in 2014. Soon, a thermal heat pump was installed in the cellar and a solar power system on the roof, all financed by loans from the Vavoid ship and contributions from the residents. They succeeded in saving around 80% of the energy costs. They used the money they saved to pay off the loans and even finance new projects, such as the balconies. Now they heat the water. The residents of number 12 Slonska Street are as good as immune to rising energy prices. While everyone else is turning the heat down, they're staying toasty warm. Recently, I was talking to my neighbor. She asked me, well, have you received the increases? I asked her, what increases? Well, the utilities increases. I said, no, we haven't been getting those for quite some time now. Stanislava keeps her home at a comfortable 22 degrees Celsius. But she could keep it warmer. My son tells me, oh, it's always nice and warm for you. Even in summer, if the days turn a little cooler now and then, you can just turn the heat on. I've already suggested that we trade places, and I think he'd actually do it. Spigniew and his deputy may be so involved because they live here in the building. And what started out as a financial motivation has since taken on aspects of climate and environmental consciousness. Their building saves nearly 70 tons of CO2 more than their neighbors. If we did this to other apartment blocks, and there are 25,000 in all of Poland, then imagine how much we would save. Some 40,000 people die every year from the smog. They'd still be alive. Zbigniew Krakowski is hoping his fellow townspeople will wake up and feel the heat. He's even thinking about running for mayor in the next elections. Converting, rethinking, breaking old habits. These things are also happening here in Nigeria. Driving a car or taking a bus to work doesn't make sense in Lagos. The city is struggling with traffic jams, which pollutes the air and try residents' patience. But it doesn't have to be that way. Check out this week's Doing Your Bits. Nobody here is going anywhere fast. It's rush hour in Lagos, Nigeria's largest city. These vehicles are clocking just 17 kilometers an hour on average. Oluwalek Bontemi Turu used to be a fisher, but in 1982, he became a boat builder. He makes both cargo and passenger vessels. Business is steady and demand is growing. The reason why so many people are buying boats these days is that water transport is faster than road transport. His biggest boats can hold up to 40 passengers. A trip that takes three hours in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic takes just one on the water. It's something I take every day while going to work and while coming back also. So I'm, I'm used to it. And if more of the 5 million car owners in Lagos switch from road to boat travel, it would benefit the environment. At the moment, we are trying to reduce our emissions, which is coming more from road transportation. If we really make use of water transportation, it's going to reduce our emissions. Going by boat costs a bit more than covering the same stretch by bus. But time is money. Congestion in Lagos is so bad, traveling over water can save you 30 hours a week. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website, 
or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Our next report is also about reducing emissions. When entire villages are not yet connected to the power grid, residents often have to rely on diesel generators and toxic kerosene lamps. That is very right, Chris. Around 35% of the rural areas in Ghana are not connected to the national power grid, but residents in the north of the country have come up with their own environmentally friendly solution. Reading and learning at night is finally possible in the village of Dilingo in the Upper West region of Ghana. The light from this solar lamp extends the day into the evening for these boys. People here say solar lamps are the way of the future. Until now, Sorichina Hanyi Lucy had to rely on kerosene or paraffin oil lamps, the light of which is decidedly weaker. And old-style lamps have other disadvantages too. The kerosene lamp produces smoke and is too costly. Inhaling the smoke makes us sick. Solar lamps are better. This man, Mustafa, is the man who supplies the solar lamps. He founded the NGO Socialite and wants to replace fossil fuel lamps in the villages with solar ones. It's all financed by donations. Students from New York develop the technology and Mustafa and his fellow campaigners in Ghana supply the housing. He assembles most of the lamps himself using simple means, a discarded cream jar or a handle made from bicycle spoke. It takes about four hours to be completely charged and it gives light about 200 hours if it is light low and gives 40 hours if it is on the high. It has to be robust if it's being used in a countryside and the lamps are built to be maintenance-free and have a long life. The people in the community, they take this light and they use it sometimes more than a week before they go to charge. But we normally insist that this lantern is charged once every week so that the battery life will be maintained. The energy for the village's lamp comes from this roof. A solar panel feeds the 12-volt solar net. Volunteer Sawanra Comfort has been trained to run the system. 12 lamps can be recharged simultaneously with enough electricity left to charge a few cell phones. I take care of the solar system and the lanterns in this community. When someone wants to recharge, they bring it to me to do it. It costs villagers around half a dollar a month to charge their solar lamps and cell phones, less than kerosene and paraffin lamps. Even those who are short of money benefit from the new technology. After all, it also helps to protect the environment. We take any produce like maize, soya bean, sorghum, or even charcoal, because not everyone in the village has ready cash. Renewable energies from the sun, wind, and geothermal energy make up just 1% of Ghana's electricity, but the West African country wants to achieve 10% fossil-free energy production by 2030. According to Isahaku Mubarak, one of Ghana's leading experts on renewable energies is going to require a major effort, especially in rural areas. He advocates focusing on simple solutions. Most of the energy needs for these rural communities are not quite sophisticated like those in the urban areas. So with the 12-volt system or 24-volt system can meet their basic needs like lightning for entertainment and then for uh, just their, uh, their call, church service and worship and it, 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 it's able to meet their, their energy needs. When the batteries are especially well charged, the electricity is used for simple pleasures like watching a film, an absolute highlight. With our system, they can also charge, they can show a cinema. We have a projector we add to the system, but depend on the community's request. We add it and we can show a movie in the night. We can they can use the facility to also entertain themselves. But the solar lamps are most important. More than 30 villages have been equipped with their own solar systems, which now supply a total of 2,000 households. 
a shining example in more ways than one. And that brings our show to a close. I hope you enjoyed it and that we'll see you again next week. Till then, take care. I'm Chris Alems from Ogun State, signing off. Time for me to say goodbye as well, but be sure to check us out on all our social media platforms so that we can stay in touch. That's all for now. I am Sandra Twinovdio. Bye-bye. No.